So you're beginning to outline your movie, your story idea, and we're gonna use the traditional three act structure. Now we always outline the movie first and this happens way before we get to the script writing process. In fact, it could take weeks, some people it takes months to develop a good beat sheet. And the reason we do that is that is our roadmap for once we begin to actually open up Final Draft or Celtex or any of the different screenwriting softwares. And before we begin to get the pleasure of writing our script, we start with a beat sheet. So whether you call it a beat sheet or a treatment, writing up your document, um, you're overviewing the plot of your story. And in fact, every scene of your story you are going to outline. And they should all be written in third person present tense. So third person means the subject is either he, she, it, they. Um, present tense simply means a verb, a simple verb tense indicating the present. So for example, he walks to his office daily. He grabs the newspaper off his desk. So many people in their screenplays write, he is walking to his office. He is grabbing a newspaper. No, incorrect. She burps loudly and excuses herself. That is the way that should be written both in your screenplay and in your treatment. So get used to writing in third person, present tense. You will use the same form of grammar when you finally get to the action lines of your screenplay. You know, the lines where you tell the actors what they are actually doing in the scene, how they move, that will all be written in this tense. So let's talk about the three-act structure. This has been around since Aristotle's book, Poetics. Um, and don't be confused because screenwriter William Goldman used five acts in his screenplays. Shakespeare often did five acts in his plays. But the bottom line is your story needs to have a beginning, middle, and end. And that has always been true for centuries. And when others talk about acts, sometimes, like in television, they're saying, you know, a TV movie might have seven acts. Well, if you're defining acts by commercial breaks, then yes, there might be seven acts. But still think of your story outline in three acts. It doesn't matter how many breaks you take for consumer reasons. What really matters is that your act one, a person needs to go to the top of the mountain. Act two, Maybe it rains, they persist, then it starts to snow, they barely survive, an avalanche nearly buries them alive. And then in act three, they overcome it, they make it to the top, or they nearly make it to the top. Or, not too often, but maybe they die, but they gain new dignity or respect or nobility for trying. That's less common, the unhappy ending. But all your stories need to have those basic three acts. And whether you think of, you know, television as having act breaks for commercial reasons, that's beside the point. Just as an aside point when we talk about genres, sitcoms are three act structures. Um, dramas have four to five acts, uh, not including the teaser, which is a little scene at the beginning of a TV drama before the opening credits. TV movies usually have seven acts, like I said before. Um, they're also sometimes referred to as act outs. These are just little mini cliffhangers at the end of each break. You know, if you watch a Shonda Rhimes show, you're certainly gonna see some great cliffhanger act outs. Regardless of how many technical act outs that your genre has, you can still just follow the basic three act structure for storytelling. So before we begin act one, we wanna go through this checklist and ask ourselves some key important questions. And don't skim over this, really think about these questions because some of these, if you don't have the proper answers or an adequate answer, you're not ready to begin yet. So let's just start talking a little more philosophically about the story we're about to write. Number one, is my story too lightweight? Yes or no? Sometimes a story isn't meant to be a movie. Sometimes a premise or a story isn't a strong enough premise for a long-running TV series. Sometimes what you're writing 
is just meant to be a poem or an entry in your journal. Not everything is meant to have the heft that a screenplay deserves. So is your story too lightweight? Now that doesn't mean that you can't tell an important movie with a narrow theme because that is okay. Some movies do that well. It's, you have to have extremely fine writing in order to do that though. So is this subject matter something I fully understand? So ask yourself that. And actually, the answer is great if your answer is no. Why? Because we tell fiction stories about things we don't understand. So the fun of being a writer, as Flannery O'Connor once famously said, is I write because I don't know what I think until I read what I say. And I love that quote. In other words, we learn about ourselves and we learn about our beliefs and we learn about our morals and what we find of value in this world when we write because we, it, it can flow through us and our characters can begin to say how we really feel about the world. So that brings us to, will this script do more than just entertain? Can we give audiences an encounter with reality? For many years, science fiction has given audiences an encounter with a reality that currently is, which is why you see so many themes of racism and societal differences, inequalities you see in science fiction. And then you often see a vision of the world as it could be, or as the world that, if we're not careful, it might be. So we want to give the audience an encounter with reality. Otherwise, we're just writing drivel, like you often see come out of Hollywood, because it might have been written by committee, meaning there were so many drafts written by so many different people, and maybe there was, I know it's a cliche, but perhaps too much involvement from an executive. Um, but, uh, or a non-creative person. So we wanna make sure as writers that we are giving the audience an encounter with reality. Okay, the world is a mess. People need stories to help them sort it out. Will your story help sort out the mess of the world? And that doesn't mean that your movies need to be preachy or didactic or heady or well, a bully pulpit, although now that I say that, I feel as if it's incredible when you can use your art as a bully pulpit because you really do hopefully have something to say to the world. Uh, but the key is to find a way to say these things in an entertaining way because we're meant to entertain first and foremost. Am I only writing a movie I really want to see. A lot of times people just write a movie because they want to write a movie. They think it might be fun or a challenge. Maybe that's okay when you're in film school or young or high school. But as an adult, we only have so much time in our day and we want to make sure that what you're going to now spend the next year of your life on, this is something that you actually want to see. This is why I don't particularly write projects that I wouldn't watch because it's so much work and effort on my part that I want to do more than just entertain and I want to make sure I entertain myself. I have written for hire. I have written with my writing partner, Rajiv. I wrote, for example, an episode of a cartoon called Yin Yang Yo for the Disney Channel um, in the early 2000s. And I didn't know anything about Wu Fu magic or Kung Fu or any of that martial arts and all the philosophy that goes behind the world that they had created on that show. But I studied it and I did my best. But it's my least favorite writing, writing for something that I 
couldn't appreciate, just as a fan. Does my story stem from character or an abstract concept? So movies are about people. So let's have a story spring up from a character that you're passionate about. You know, Private Ryan is a character that we want to follow. Aladdin is a character. The Fugitive is a character that we want to follow. So does my story stem from character? And people get a lot of different ideas for movies, but I think it really solidifies when you are writing about a particular character. However, you could be more of a high concept writer. You could be a what if writer. And that is someone who says, what if you could clone dinosaurs? Or what if an asteroid hit the earth? What if stories are normally big stories? You know, what if a virus took over the whole world? Sadly, that story doesn't seem like such a what if in these times. But they don't usually just ask something small like, what if people could clone sheep? It's the scope of the story in a what if story is usually a lot bigger. They require big screen showmanship. So um, don't take on the stuff that you can't deliver. So you want to push yourself, but you also want to know what your lane is. Play to your strengths in a genre when you are writing. Your first script is going to give you a niche. Embrace your niche. I took that advice early on in my screenwriting, and I'm so glad I did. Because I know that my niche and my lane is character-driven dramedies. I started off in sitcoms, and I do believe that I write sitcoms well, and I am a comedy writer, but the older I get, the more I appreciate dramedies, the mixture. And now, fortunately, that is the trend um, in, in television. You know, it's hard to label a lot of the shows that you binge watch, because are they funny? Yes. But are they dramatic? Yes. So. Instead of spending my life trying to pursue something that is just not my lane, I want to kind of stay focused. Now, within my lane of character-driven dramedies, I've done historical pieces. I've done scenes set in the 1950s that had a little bit of a Alfred Hitchcock on a train vibe. I've done stories set in the 1970s showcasing a dated game show. I've done stories that utilize the dialogue and pacing and the language of 1960s sex comedies, like Doris Day and Rock Hudson movies. So there's a lot of room within your niche, but um, you really want to focus on what you're good at and stay in your lanes. And that doesn't mean you don't want to push yourself, as I just demonstrated. You want to push yourself, but stay in the lane that you do best because that is uniquely what you bring to the market and to the world. What is the thing I do that nobody else does as well as I do? That is a little trickier because, of course, you don't really believe you're the best in the world. Um, it's a, probably a little narcissistic, but you do want to find sub-genres within your niche where you have a unique voice based on your life experiences. For example, Rajiv and I discovered that what we do was religious satire. And that is because both of us have Christian backgrounds and um, we knew that we could talk about certainly evangelical Christianity in American culture in a way that a lot of writers in Hollywood just could not. All of this resulted in Jesus People, our first film, which was a mockumentary set in the world of Christian music. But we also worked in religious themes in all of our sitcoms and screenplays 
because that's just an area that interests us and an area that we knew we wrote well. Doing the thing that you do well gives you the license to try something else. Are you ready to tell the story? Yes or no? For example, Steven Spielberg sat on Schindler's List for 10 years because he felt he wasn't good enough to tell that story. So, if it's a story that interests you, but you don't, you're not confident that you are yet mature enough or wise enough or ready enough to tell this particular story, put it on the back burner, burner, put it on the back burner and wait until you have all the tools you need to finally tell that story. Are you going to tell a specific story? Don't try to be all things to all people. If you've studied screenwriting before, you've probably heard the phrase, the specific is universal. And it really is. People understand more than you think they will. When you pull from your own life and you tell specific examples, and you tell specific stories from your own life that you feel like only your best friend would understand, that is the best kind of writing because what you end up being surprised at is people will go on that journey with you. And even if they don't have that specific life experience, they will see themselves and see their life reflected in something that you do there. For example, My Big Fat Greek Wedding. That is a movie that Hollywood would theoretically never make. Why would we make a movie about such a small Greek American culture. And it took Tom Hanks and Rita Wilson to move Nia Vardalos's script forward and look, it's become one of the biggest romantic comedies of all time, if not the biggest. And the whole world saw their family in that Greek family. So if you know where your script begins and ends, then you'll be able to fill in the gaps. So don't begin writing your script until your story is hammered out and fully outlined. And that's why we're talking about the beat sheet today. On average, a beat sheet for a full length feature film might be between 10 to 20 pages single spaced. Now, if you're writing a short film, it might be three pages single spaced. Um, don't get too tied into these numbers, but just know that a beat sheet, if you are outlining every single scene as it plays out in your movie, typically, again, for me, for a 90 minute film, it's been about 10 to 20 pages single spaced of outline. We are in the emotion business. Feeling comes first in stories because we're in the emotion business. We need to start with our heart, not with our head. So you're not writing a technical manual. You don't need all these boring details because it's your journalistic responsibility to, t to tell them. We want to manipulate feelings, and I know that sounds terrible, manipulating feelings, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. You're just trying to move the audience towards laughter, towards fear, towards joy, towards understanding, and we need to manipulate the audience emotions in a good way before we do that. If you want to make people go from here to there, you got to make them want to go from here to there, which is why the beginning of your story is so important. People are hungry for stories about the heart and they want to go on a journey of human growth. Capture their interest and their heart from the beginning of the film and maybe they'll stick around in an environment where there is so much competition for people's eyeballs. You should show bad behavior, sin, evil, whatever you want to call it, but there needs to be consequences in your story. So someone must pay the price. Obviously, there's an exception if you're writing a tragedy and you have your character turning their back on the way out and refusing redemption. Those stories do exist and those stories are important, but generally we want to show evil without endorsing evil. And then everybody has a line at which they feel that is. For example, I don't show guns very much in movies. I mean, I think one guy 
in the movie Belleville showed up with a rifle to protect his farm. And that's it in over 12 films. Um, because even when I bring in a level of violence and action, I try to find ways to just do that. Not because I don't think people shouldn't be able to own guns or protect themselves, or I don't believe in the Second Amendment, but because I think that Americans have a fetish and I don't want to contribute towards that. So everybody has a different line as to what they want to show and what they want to put out there in the world. So let's just talk about the differences in genres. So comedy usually ends in forgiveness. For example, Mrs. Doubtfire lies but is forgiven in the end. Um, science fiction leaves us considering the way our choices contribute to the future. That's often a theme in science fiction. Dramas usually end in redemption. Crime dramas usually put out the notion that crime doesn't pay. That's sort of the lesson that crime dramas usually leave the audience with. And of course, romantic comedies love to sell the idea that love conquers all, which is why they almost end up with people together. I particular, when writing um, about the subject of relationships, I don't even like the word romance because I don't entirely know what that is. So when I write about a relationship, I usually end the movie with the beginning of the relationship where characters decide they're going to give this a try. And that is where I want to take my story to. I don't normally perpetrate the idea of happy ever after. Let's also talk about film versus television. Um, movies are usually about characters who change. And TV is mostly about people who do not change or people who cannot change. So you look at movies and It's a Wonderful Life, George Bailey changes. That's what we want to see in a movie. However, the characters on Seinfeld and Mary Tyler Moore show, they don't change very much. You know, obviously TV shows that feature children, they physically change, they grow. Characters do evolve a little bit on TV, but it's more about making the audience comfortable with characters who are familiar and behave in familiar ways, which is why we generally want the characters on Friends to just behave like the characters on Friends. Um, and um, yet movies would be unsatisfying if a character started one way and did not grow by the end.